Good morning. It is nine o'clock, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. It's February the 10th, 2021. And the weather here at the Environmental Center is a typical February winter morning for the Dallas Fort Worth area. It is cloudy, it's misty, it's cold, and it's breezy. Okay, we want to say a very special welcome to W.E. Griner and to Jose Joe May Schools for joining us this morning. Now, if you are watching and you have not joined or registered, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. This morning, we're gonna do thermal energy. During this virtual field trip, students will investigate methods of thermal energy transfer, including conduction, convection, and radiation. Students will also verify through investigation that thermal energy moves in a predictable pattern from warmer to cooler until all substances attain the same temperature. Mr. Monroe is going to talk to you about conduction. Ms. Ramirez will cover convection. Ms. Fuller will speak to you about radiation. And then Mr. Broughton, We'll tell you about thermal energy moves in a predictable pattern. This is a virtual field trip, so you cannot talk to us directly, but you can send in questions. Uh, www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Munro is going to talk to you about conduction. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Munro, and my part of your virtual field trip today is the heat transfer that we call conduction. Um, I'm gonna move my camera just a little bit and I wanna show you something that's going on on this lab table. Uh, I have a hot plate here with a beaker on it and it has about 200 milliliters of water in it. And of course, my hot plate is not really functioning right this morning. I was hoping by this time the water would be boiling, but I want you to be thinking about the heat transfer that's going on right now. And then what I'm going to do when I change the camera, I'm going to share my screen with you and we're gonna go through a short PowerPoint to hopefully give you a better understanding about certain heat transfers, especially the one that I'm focusing on called conduction. Bear with me just a minute while I share my screen with you. All right, understanding heat transfer. There they are, conduction, convection, and radiation. The one that I'm focusing on is conduction. Now, to get an understanding of how heat is transferred, we most, most of all, we've got to understand what is heat. This is the movement of thermal energy from a substance at a higher temperature to another at a lower temperature. Heat versus temperature. Heat is the actual energy. Temperature is the measure of average kinetic energy of particles in a substance. Now, heat is not temperature. I want you to understand that. Heat transfer, listen. Heat always moves from a warmer place to a cooler place. Hot objects in a cooler room will cool to the room temperature. Boy, and I can attest to that because the heater in my lab is not working. 
and it's very cold in there. So if I was to take this uh, beaker with this warm water in it and move it into my room, it wouldn't be long before the water inside the beaker would match the room temperature. Cold objects in a warmer room will heat up to the room temperature. Heat transfer methods, heat transfers in three ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. Now, conduction means that the heat is being transferred as the flowing of heat energy from a high temperature object to a lower temperature object, such as a pan over a fire or a heat source. This is cooking by conduction. When you heat a metal strip at one end, the heat travels to the other end. As you heat the metal, the particles vibrate that make up that piece of metal. These vibrations make the adjacent particles also vibrate and so on and so on. The vibrations are passed along the metal, so is the heat. We call this conduction. The outer electrons of metal atoms drip and are free to move. When the metal is heated, the sea of electrons gain kinetic energy and transfer it throughout the metal. Insulators such as wood and plastic do not have the sea of electrons, which is why they do not conduct heat as well as metals. There you go. Metal is a conductor. Wood is an insulator. Metal conducts the heat away from your hands. Wood does not conduct the heat away from your hands as, as well as the metal. So the wood feels warmer than the metal. And I can attest to that. I like to cook out a lot of times. And all the utensils that I use on my smoker or on the, even the handle on my smoker, guess what? It is made out of wood. Now, I'm going to go back and I want you guys to think about that uh, little uh, the beaker and the hot plate and it still hasn't boiled the water yet. So basically what I'm going to do is stop right here and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gorman in case some of you have any questions about uh, about conduction, okay? So let me stop sharing my screen. And I'll give it back to Dr. Gorman so that he can answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, Dr. Gorman. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, the question came in is give an example of conduction that we can do. And on a sunny day, even though it may be cold outside on a sunny day, go up to a window and put your hand on that glass. Uh, make sure it's a single pane glass, not a double or triple pane glass like some of the homes have it now because you probably wouldn't feel any difference, but you'll actually feel the warmth coming from the sun. Uh, thank you, Mr. M Monroe and students. And now we're going to let Ms. Ramirez tell us about convection. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning about convection, which is just another method of heat transfer. So as I'm going through uh, the presentation today, I have a couple of essential questions that I want y'all to be able to answer by the end of the presentation. So the first one is, um, what is convection? And the second one is give one example from my presentation and explain how it relates to convection. So take a moment, uh, if you need to, to write down this really quick or um, take a picture with your phone so that you can be able to answer these by the end of the presentation. So just two very simple questions I want y'all to keep in mind. So let's start off with what is convection? So convection is just a method of heat transfer and it's transfer of heat as heat is moving from a or moving through a liquid or a gas. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples of convection. Now, one of the most common ones that you guys are probably familiar with um, is a very common uh, lamp or toy, and it's a lava lamp. 
Now, the way convection works in a lava lamp, this is plugged into an outlet. There's a light bulb inside. That light bulb is uh, generating heat, and that heat is actually warming up the liquid inside the lava lamp. As that liquid is getting heated up, it's becoming less dense because, um, and because it's becoming less dense, it starts to rise to the top. And as it's rising to the top, it's also in this case, bringing some of the glitter with it. Now, as that liquid rises to the top, it's further away from the heat source. So it's going to start to cool down. And as it starts to cool down, that liquid's gonna become more dense. And we know that things that are more dense are heavier, so they're gonna to start to sink back down. Well, it sinks back down, it's gonna warm up again because it's next to the heat source and the whole cycle is gonna start all over again. So that's how convection is evident in a lava lamp. Um, like Mr. Monroe, I didn't realize how long it was gonna take for my other lava lamp to get going. Uh, but here's another example of a lava lamp. It's been plugged in for over an hour now and it's still not quite heated up yet. Uh, but eventually, what do you think is going to happen to this yellow blob of wax on the bottom? So eventually, we're going on over an hour and 15 minutes now, eventually that yellow blob will become heated. And because again, there's another heat source in here, there's a light bulb in here. That light bulb will heat up that yellow wax blob and it will uh, become less dense. It's going to rise to the top because it's lighter. Once it gets to the top, same thing's going to happen. It's away from the heat source, so that wax is going to start to cool down. It's going to become more dense and heavier, and then it's going to start to sink, and the whole cycle will uh, happen all over again. Now, there's another example of convection, and I have it right here. This is a cool uh, little spinning candle. So one of my coworkers yesterday saw it, and she said it reminded her of when she was a child, and I guess during Christmas, they would always put decorations like this out. Uh, so here we have a candle and then we have a spinning tin top. So why do you think the candle top is spinning? What is causing that phenomenon? So here we have our candle, it's providing heat. And that candle is actually heating up the air on top of it. And we know that things that are hot, they will rise to the top as we saw with our lava lamp. So that hot air is rising and it's pushing against these blades, causing the blades to spin. So now we have that beautiful spinning candle effect all because of convection. So our next thing that we're going to look at, I have a quick PowerPoint presentation so that we can examine some other experiments with convection. So let me share my desktop screen with you guys and it might take just a second to get that um, going. So I did some other experience that I had to do ahead of time for safety reasons. Um, if you do replicate these experiments, please have adult supervision because we are using fire and flames and then practice lab and fire safety. Um, if you do choose to replicate these with an adult's help. So let me put this in full screen so that you guys can see it. Now I decided to make my own spinning candle. And so I just used tin foil and I had an old baking tin. Uh, that you can cook in. I just cut it in, into a circle and then I made a little fan. And then I also made another spinning candle with paper. Um, I will say if you do that one with an adult's help, uh, just make sure you have uh, practice fire safety in case that paper falls into your candle. Uh, but notice how both of those spinning uh, tops were moving because of the convection. Now this one is a tea bag rocket experiment. And what do you think is going to happen as that hot flame moves down that tea bag that I tore in half? So hopefully you guys see that it actually flew, it went up into the air. So again, hot air rises. When we set that tea bag, it's so light. When we set it on fire, um, it creates hot air around it and that hot air is rising. And then we see as it rises to the top, the flame is pretty much extinguished. Um, it starts to become more dense and it starts to sink down to the bottom. So the main concept behind convection is hot things will rise, cooler things will sink. And where do you think this would also apply if you have looked up into the sky, you might have seen some of these flying around. Think of hot air balloons. Here's another example. Now this example of 
uh, water in a pan that's boiling not only represents convection, but also represents other forms of heat transfer. So think about what other forms of heat transfer are evident in that video there. Now, what I did is I heated up water and I put a balloon on top of a empty bottle of water. There's obviously air inside that bottle. And when I put that bottle inside the hot water, notice the balloon inflated. So the hot air, the air inside the water bottle got heated and it rose to the top inflating the balloon. So those are just a couple of experiments. Um, if you would like to do those experiments with the help of an adult, so adult, adult supervision, uh, these are some resources you can go to uh, to make your own spinning candles or uh, the flying tea bag experiment. And even some fun things like solar bags. Uh, so they're using the heat energy to fly and rise up to the top. So the next thing I have for you guys is more, um, how does convection relate to me? Uh, so something I did is on Monday, I took the temperature. So I have a two story house and my upstairs is usually more warmer than my downstairs. And that makes sense because we know that hot air rises. So here's my thermostat upstairs. It says it was 66 degrees on Monday. However, downstairs, it was, it barely made it to 60. It was about 58. Uh, so it's almost a 10 degree difference between my upstairs and my downstairs. Uh, so again, we know that hot air rises and cooler air sinks. And I remember when I was a kid, my dad would always have to go up into the attic. Uh, sometimes we'd find raccoons and other animals living in the attic. And he always hated going up there. And every time he came down from the attic, he would always be sweating. So it is so much hotter um, the further up you go in your house. So we know, again, warm air rises because it is less dense and cold air sinks because it is more dense. And when I mean dense, look at this diagram over here. So see the cold air, how closely packed those uh, air molecules are compared to the hot air. They're more, they have more energy, more kinetic energy. They're more spread apart. And that's what makes that hot air less dense, causing it to rise. Now, my last thing is a quick challenge question for you guys. Um, give two examples of convective heat transfer and then explain how that convective heat transfer is used in your example. So think of your everyday life or think of things that you see outside or on TV and how can uh, convection be related to some of those things. Um, and here's just a cool little video that I found. Uh, this is actually um, a lantern festival in Thailand and it's a Buddhist festival. So think about how convection currents are allowing these lanterns to be raised up into the sky. So it's very similar to that tea bag experiment. Um, so in Thailand, the act of releasing these lanterns symbolizing symbolizes kind of like letting go of all your problems. Um, and it's a kind of a cool little way. They say that if you make a wish when you release your lantern that it will come true. Uh, so the candle warms the air inside the lantern, causing it to float up and stay airborne until that candle is extinguished. So again, going back to hot things tend to rise and cool air or liquids will tend to sink. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty cool festival. Um, something, to, something worthwhile to see, all those lanterns flying in the sky. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that video there. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And that's all I have for you guys today on convection. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and pass it back to Dr. Gorman and he's gonna answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And a question that came in was uh, another example of convection. And the one that uh, listed was uh, heat watering a pan, I mean, uh, heating up a pan of water or a stove heating up a pan of water on the stove. Uh, Ms. Ramirez did a good example of that by using the flask with the balloon on top. And you see when the water heats up that the balloon will expand because the warm air rises. Thank you again. And now we're gonna let Ms. Fuller tell us about radiation. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm gonna to talk to you about the heat transfer in radiation. So let me uh, share my screen with you. And 
uh, radiation, the thermal heat transfer. Now we've got all three of the different kinds of thermal heat transfer in this illustration. We've got conduction like Mr. Monroe described to you of the, uh, the heat, the, the fire, this is a gas stove, so you can see the fire down there, uh, is heating up the bottom of the uh, kettle itself and that, that metal is transferring the heat to the water inside the, the kettle. Now inside the kettle, there, is, there are convection currents being created that Ms. Uh, Ramirez demonstrated to you. Uh, they are circular uh, motions. Uh, we, we see convection in a lot of different places in our lives. And the tea kettle is a perfect example of this, of it uh, roiling and going around. And then finally, the one I'm going to, the type of thermal heat transfer I'm going to talk about is radiation. And in this case, the heat is radiated out into the air of the kitchen from the hot kettle. So let's uh, what, see what radiation is. It's the emission or transmission of energy in the form of waves or particles through space or through a material medium. So radiation can go through space. It doesn't have to have metal or air or water. It can go through space. Now, when we talk about radiation, we're essentially talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. And this, these are waves. Um, and uh, the one you're probably most familiar with are radio waves and microwaves, though we've got a lot of others. Uh, radio waves are very, very big. They're taller than buildings. And as the, uh, the waves move from one end of the spectrum to the other, they get smaller and smaller and vibrate faster and faster. So um, it, even though radio waves are, are not gonna cook your food, microwaves will, and you can uh, see infrared lamps when you go to the ball game and they've got that red lamp hanging over the peanuts and uh, hot dogs that they've cooked about two hours before. Uh, and uh, also we've got something called ultraviolet uh, waves and those can give you a sunburn. So let's go to the next thing. Let's talk about the greenhouse effect. So let me move this over here. And um, solar ra radiation, in other words, this, this is uh, heat that we get from the sun. It's reflected by the earth in the atmosphere, but some of it passes through the atmosphere is absorbed and readmitted in all directions by greenhouse gas molecules. Now, this is the thing that they talk about all the time on the news about the greenhouse effect. And um, the greenhouse effect is warming our planet because this heat radiation gets trapped by these uh, greenhouse gas molecules, things like methane, water vapor, carbon dioxide, things like that. And the effect of this, it warms the atmosphere and also the Earth's surface. And infrared radiation is emitted by the Earth's surface after it's been heated. And most radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and then it warms it. So let's come down here or not. Okay, now this is one that, these are two. Uh, types of heat transfer that you're familiar with. The, the picture on the left is a um, heat lamp. Um, and uh, you see this, sometimes people use this for a heat treatment if they've got bronchitis. And sometimes uh, they use it, to, um, like I said, to heat food that's already been cooked so it doesn't cool off. Um, on the right, you see charcoal briquettes. Now, after the fire dies down, those charcoal briquettes emit a lot of heat. It's infrared heat. They're not going to be emitting any light, just heat energy. Now, snakes can see infrared. 
So if you're if you're standing in the forest at night wearing a jacket and you're thinking, well, no snake will bother me. Well, snake doesn't have any problem seeing you whatsoever because especially the pit vipers, they've got a, a sense organ on their face that help them to sense uh, uh, to sense the infrared, any 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 warm-blooded animal uh, will give off uh, this infrared. So my rabbit or my chicken or myself, we're all emitting infrared heat. It's radiating out from our bodies, and animals that can see it know exactly where we are. Now, if you look at the guy the, over there on the the left, you'll see that he's got something shrouding his uh, left arm, that's a plastic bag, it's black. We would not be able to see through it, but if an, an animal that sees infrared can see his arm just fine, thank you very much. Okay, now bullfrogs and mosquitoes can see infrared. And um, uh, frogs are very versatile and bullfrogs especially have very good vision and they have infrared vision and they have eyes that can see above the water and below the water and they, they use an enzyme to, uh, to see this, it supercharges their infrared vision. And uh, then the mosquito, now this would make sense because when you normally get bitten by a mosquito, you're sitting in the backyard at nighttime, it's dark, but that mosquito doesn't have any problem whatsoever finding you. They can sense or see body heat and use uh, the heat signature of the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out to uh, locate you and come drink your blood. Um, here are fish. Now, uh, I never thought about fish being able to see infrared, but they can. And uh, these four, the one at the top is a salmon. The one over on the far left is a goldfish. In the middle is a piranha. Now that would make sense to me because if an animal's in the Amazon River and the piranha is looking for something to eat. If he can see infrared, he knows, you know, right where to go and start eating the, the leg of the, the cow or the person or whoever, capybara, or whoever's in the water. And then the guy, little guy over there on the right is called a chiclet. And uh, they're from Africa. They're really interesting. Um, and let's see. Okay. The thing about goldfish, goldfish have better vision than people do. And not only can they see in uh, visible light like we can, they can also see infrared and they can also see uh, ultraviolet, which is also really rare. So uh, they're the only animal that can see in all three spectrums. So let's uh, go ahead and get out of our little PowerPoint here. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you, this is an infrared lamp. And I'm sure you've seen these before. This is one I was talking about that heat, heat up the peanuts or the hot dogs at the ball game. This is the one that I have on top, well, not right now, uh, on top of my gecko's cage. And it keeps, he's cold blooded and it's cold in my room. So this lamp keeps him warm and I can feel my face warming up from this. So um, uh, radiation is very important. I mean, you're talking about the entire planet being warmed uh, through radiation from the sun, our food, uh, and also our little animals. If you have any questions about uh, heat transfer through radiation, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to help you with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. That was quite interesting, especially the part about some of the animals. The mosquitoes, uh, the piranha. Uh, I just thought the mosquito just flew around and just haphazardly landed on me and bit me every night. I didn't realize that he kind of targeted me and looked for me. Uh, now a question came in about uh, to kind of describe radiation. And we're gonna talk about the sunlight. 
uh, the sun emits electromagnetic radiation. This radiation can be captured and turned into heat or electricity. And an example of that, of course, would be your solar panels. We do have some solar panels on top of our building. Now, Mr. Broughton is going to do about a program about thermal energy. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Yes, so I'm going to um, demonstrate that heat moves in a, or that thermal energy uh, moves in a predictable pattern from uh, warm to cold. So I'm going to share my screen here to um, show you what I'm going to uh, do. I just need to pair my iPad with the um, computer here. There we go. All right, now I think you can see uh, my desk. And so I have um, some hot water in here. Um, this is an insulated container that'll keep that water hot. Nothing in here yet, I'll pour the hot water in there. Cold water in this container. A couple of uh, thermometers that I'm gonna use to measure the temperature of the hot and cold water. And we're gonna see how thermal energy moves from hot to cold in a predictable pattern. So I'm gonna first pour some warm water into uh, this beaker here. I think that's gonna be enough, about uh, right around 300 or so milliliters. It doesn't matter um, exactly how much I, I have. And then I'm gonna measure the temperature of that water. And you might be able to see the alcohol in this thermometer rising pretty quickly. So let's just see what it goes up to. Looks like it hit 60. Let me take a better look at it here. It looks like it hit about 64 degrees Celsius. And my cold water, which all I did to get as cold was leave it in the fridge overnight, is, well, that's a pretty good refrigerator because it, it went down all the way to about, I would say, three degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna record those temperatures in my notebook here. And I forgot to put a, uh, a, uh, a time for zero seconds. So I'm gonna just write that at the top three and 64. So at least it's recorded. And now I'm gonna place this container inside this container so that we can see how temperature uh, changes with both of these and start my timer here too. And I'm going to record those temperatures every 30 seconds. Oh, and now what happened with my iPad? There we go. So you can see I've got my hot water thermometer on the outside here, my cold water thermometer in this thing. And I, in about 10 more seconds, I'm going to record the temperatures of both. So for hot, it's already dropped down to about 50, it looks like, degrees. And cold, it's still maybe four degrees. Oop. So there I recorded those temperatures, 50 and four. And we're almost coming up on one minute now. So I've got to take another look again. And the uh, hot water is now, um, looks like it's about 48 or so. And cold water is up to about 10. So that's after one minute. And we're almost to a minute and a half. So I'll take a look at that hot again, and it is, I would say at about 44. And this one is about up to 
Oh, almost 15, we'll say. So you can see that they're eventually going to become the same temperature. And we'll see if it only takes four minutes or not. I did not do this ahead of time. So we'll, maybe I'll get lucky and maybe I won't. But I think we'll see the trend of what's happening. So now the hot water is about 41. Cold water is 15. A eh, little above 15, 16. And we're already coming up on two and a half minutes. So that hot water is now dropped down to 37 maybe. And the cold water is up to, looks like about 18. What did I say the hot water was? 37? So getting closer, now we're almost to three minutes. So that hot water is, I would say actually still at probably 37 and the cold water has gone up to, looks like 20. So one more minute and we'll uh, see what happens. That hot water is now not, not so hot. I would say it's at about 35. And there's three and a half minutes. So I'm gonna record, yeah, 35 for that degrees Celsius. And the cold water looks like the temperature has gone up to about 22. And when we get to four minutes, um, We'll see where we're at. Looks like we're about down to maybe 33 with the hot and 24 with the cold. And that's been four minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my time here. Uh, and just move this back, get that guy out of the way. So there's my completed uh, table. This column was hot water. The water started off at 64 degrees and kind of steadily decreased in temperature. The cold water started off at three degrees and gradually increased in temperature because the heat, the thermal energy was moving from hot to cold. And you've seen this, if you ever get a a uh, drink at McDonald's or um, any any restaurant, they'll bring you um, a drink with ice in it. And if you don't drink it fast enough, that ice is going to melt because heat in the room is moving from um, the room in, into your drink and, and uh, cooling it down. But what else we can do to record some data here is graph this. So I've created a little graph here and then my time is at the bottom from 30 seconds to four minutes. My temperature is going to be on the y-axis. And um, I did not label the temperature, the, put the numbers for the temperature ahead of time. Cause like I said, I didn't do this before, but since my highest temperature was 64, maybe if I do uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, I could almost get the four on there. I'm gonna go ahead and just do that. It's going to be real close. And now I can't use this uh, black uh, Sharpie anymore. I'm going to use two different colored pens. Um, one to uh, blue will be for cold water. And this kind of reddish pen will be for the hot water. And I'll do hot water first. So it started off at 64. So I'll put a little dot pretty close to the top there at zero seconds. And then after 30 seconds, it dropped to 50. And after one minute, it was 48. That's about right there. And then 44. So 
something like that. 41 after two minutes. So something like that. 37 after two and a half. Right about there. It was 37 again, which is not what I had expected to see, but that's what I that's what the thermometer said. So that's what I'm gonna record. Then 35. And then finally 33, which would be right about there. And if I connect those lines, are these dots, I mean, with, with a line, you can see the temperature decreased kind of rapidly at first, but then it kind of leveled off. And now if I do my cold water, it was three degrees um, at zero seconds. And then it was four degrees after 30 seconds. And then 10 degrees after one minute. And then 15. And then 16. Let me move my hand here so you can see how the dots are coming out. Uh, and I think, yeah, that froze up again. There we go. Uh, 16 after two minutes. Eighteen after two and a half. Twenty after three minutes. Twenty-two and then twenty-four. And if I connect these lines, you can see the temperature was kind of gradually rising over those four minutes. And if you look at the the trend here, I bet if I had just gone one more minute. Uh, maybe a minute and a half, they, these, the cold and the hot would have reached the same temperature because thermal energy does in fact uh, move from hot to cold in that predictable pattern. Uh, so we um, did quite a bit of tables and graphs to, to, to demonstrate that, but it's again, it's something you see every day if you drink um, a cold drink, it's going to get warm. And if you drink a hot drink, it's going to get cold if you don't drink it fast enough. All right, so uh, that is my time. I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions and wrap things up. Thank you, Mr. Broughton, uh, for a very interesting experiment. But most importantly, uh, it was really important that he graph he kept his data, he collected his data. He put it on a graph in case he ever needs to look at this again or if he needs to prove what he said. A good example there of keeping your data, recording your data. Uh, now, my question came in was, what is thermal energy? Uh, thermal energy, also called heat energy, is produced when the rise in temperature causes atoms and molecules to move faster, colliding with each other. The energy that comes from the temperature of the heating substance is called thermal energy. Now I am going to share my screen. Today we did a program on thermal energy. During this virtual field trip, students investigated methods of thermal energy transfer, thermal energy transfer, including conduction, convection, and radiation. Students also verified through investigation that thermal energy moves in a predictable pattern from warmer to cooler until all these substances attain the same temperature. Uh, Mr. Broughton told you if we had another minute and a half, the two lines would have came together. Uh, Mr. Monroe talked about conduction, Ms. Ramirez, convection, Ms. Fuller, radiation, and Mr. Broughton did the experiment about thermal energy. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. I hope you have a great cold day and also a great life.